Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Oh, I see Nia arriving. A couple of familiar faces. My name's Rafael. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. And uh, people trickling in with us. So this is where we do a little patter and hello and welcome for about one minute while people arrive. So yeah. today we have an awesome topic, the art of pricing. But I'm just going to introduce myself and then my my esteemed colleague and friend first. So uh, my name is Rafael, originally from New Zealand. And I can see Karen has just dropped in the chat that she's from Brisbane. I love it when people do that because you never know where people come from. If you want to drop in the chat where you're from, uh, it's always fun and curious to see. And people are in all kinds of time zones. So sometimes people turn on the camera, you're like, oh, it's dark where they are. So for me, I'm in Bali, Indonesia. It's eight in the morning, so I'm just sipping my coffee here. And uh, hi, Susan from New York. Good to see you. Hi to Wonderful. you. <laughs> Good to see you. I see your hair is blonde now. <laughs> it's oh, getting a bit of sunshine here. <laughs> Mine's red. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, as I said, my name is Rafael. I feel hookstra. I'm originally from New Zealand. And I've done a few things in life, became a scientist, and now I find myself as an artist business consultant. So I help artists with, well, actually quite a few things, but like mostly I just emphasize Instagram because that's like one pain point. It's something that really people want help with. So we, we start there and then sometimes there's other things, it's creating courses and websites and marketing and newsletters, all kinds of things. So that's how I've connected with many of you, and some of you perhaps know my colleague as well. And one other pain point that artists have, and creatives in general, is how to price their service, how to value themselves and their work. So in speaking with uh, my guest, that's what we decided to share some info on, because he's a, an expert, an absolute expert. And uh, we have at least three things in common, probably more. Uh, we're both from New Zealand, we both trained as scientists, and we both have big beards. So without further ado, I must welcome Mr. Logan Elliott, also known as the Flammable Entrepreneur. Amazing. Thank you, Rafael. I really appreciate that. And I was just thinking, I think your beard's a little bit bigger than mine at the moment. So uh, <laughs> I need to work on growing it's not up, a competition at the club. <laughs> <laughs> Who's more of a New Zealander? <laughs> I love it. Hey, so so great to be here and really excited about um, talking to you all today and running the, the pricing workshop we're going to run. Um, first thing I'll say is, look, if you, if you are in a position where you can turn your camera on so we can see you, we'd love that. Totally all good if you don't want to, but we love being able to see the audience um, that we're speaking to as well so we can see your smiles um, and you're nodding away at things as well. So definitely turn it on if you can. Fantastic. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be running you through the pricing workshop, and we're going to be going to really focus on pricing for visual creatives. Now, we've got a lot of different people in this audience here in different areas, different areas of, of visual and creativity. So what we'd love you to do is just briefly share something in the chat around what you do creatively. Right, this could be, maybe it's a creative hobby, maybe it's a creative business that you have. We'd love you to just share something in the chat around your connection to art and your connection to creativity. Do you have a business doing it? Are you a freelancer? Are you a, an artist? Are you a designer? Are you an illustrator? Tell us a little bit more just so we can really see who's in here as well. Um, and I can already see here we've got a photographer. I love that. Fantastic. So we've got lots of well, drawing. Those, yeah. All those answers for all of them. We've got to mention one thing, which is that we're very lucky because Logan is in high demand. He's a very busy guy, but he's agreed to give uh, three free consultations to uh, to people who who really want that and, and qualify for that. So uh, we're going to give some details on that at the end of this webinar. Awesome. Thank you but so you much mentioned... for that reminder. Absolutely. No, that, that's so, so great. So um, so as everyone's putting that in there, so so basically um, what we are doing is, I'm, I'm, as um, Raphael mentioned, I'm giving away three freebie coaching sessions. They're 30-minute coaching sessions. Um, and, and if you're interested in, in potentially being one of those three people, um, you just fill in the survey that we're going to send out. I'm going to put the survey link in the chat now and again at the end. So you can even just pop it open now so you've got it there if you want to do that. Now, it is a very helpful survey to also just understand where your gaps are when it comes to creative business. I mean, I'll select three people to jump on a call with um, and give you some creative 
of business coach because that's what I do. So um, I will talk a bit more about that. But in the meantime, just wanted to share we've got in here mixed media sculptures, acrylic on canvas, um, oil painting, calligraphy, uh, small business helping to promote Brisbane based artists, paint too. Love that, Karen. Handmade lettering, uh, ha hand lettering, graphic design, hey, Fuller, uh, landscape painter, uh, landscape painter, painting in Minneapolis, representational artist, abstract. Uh, there's so many amazing things there art, drawing, photography. Amazing. I love it. Such a range. Absolutely. Oil painting and drawing. So, so good. And I love that. I love that we've got a, an amazing creative audience and such a range in here. So look, what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll post that thing in the chat I just mentioned now, which is the survey that you can fill in if you're interested in that session. But now I'm going to share a bit more about who I am. So um, yes, I've got a Kiwi accent like Raphael as well. Um, and my background is that I had my own creative business uh, out of New Zealand for 11 years. So it was in the visual uh, live event space. So we had characters, performers, dancers, pyrotechnics, fire, all sorts of interesting things for the New Zealand events industry. So very wacky, very wild, very crazy creative company. Um, and I built that up New Zealand wide, um, eventually sold that company. Now, during that time running that company, I also got into the business side of creativity because I was really passionate about the intersection of creativity and creative arts and business. Um, so I ended up doing a business master's to learn more about really business for creatives. Um, and then eventually I ended up working with universities, lecturing, helping run master's programs, public programs, mentoring, coaching, teaching, you know how things evolved. So I worked with a lot of creative um, people to really help them grow their businesses. And eventually when I sold my, my own company, my own creative company, I went full-time as a creative business coach. So these days I'm a full-time creative business coach. I've got a company called Flammable Entrepreneur, uh, as Raphael mentioned, um, and I have a team that I, that I work with as well. Um, clients are based all over the world, uh, wide, wide range of areas but all in the visual creative space so a lot of people who are artists creatives visual artists of all sorts a lot of graphic designers illustrators as well so a big variation of different people and i'm very passionate about helping people with the business stuff so my big belief is that there's so many amazing highly talented creative people like many people we've got here um, in the zoom room that you know are really good at what they do when it comes to the craft to the art to the the, the visual creative side and what happens is that they're struggling. They're struggling to maybe, maybe they want to make this into a, a full-time income or they want to earn money on the side of their job to do this. And they, they find it's hard and they start thinking, maybe I'm not that good at the craft. And I see again and again, it's not the craft, it's the business stuff, right? It's the business stuff that people really struggle with. Okay, so one of those business things that I, I teach and I work with people on is around pricing. And I'm so, so passionate about the subject for one main reason, it's about helping you get paid what you're worth for your amazing creative abilities and skills. Now, it is a very complex topic and there's so much to learn. I feel like I could run a, a 12 week program just on pricing, um, but we're definitely gonna be diving into some really good stuff today to really get you thinking and thinking about how you can price yourself um, high actually is, is effectively what it's about. How can you get paid more for the work that you do? Now, whether you're offering a, a service of some sort, if you're teaching art or whether you are selling products or selling art pieces or you're freelancing or designing, whatever it is, these things are all applicable to you because it's really about how do we get you valued by people that maybe are willing to pay for what you do. Right, and it's a big challenge, right? A lot of people, they spend a lot of time on their creativity, a lot of time on their art, and they're struggling to make it work, right? They're like, I feel like I'm working all the time on my art business or my, my, my design business, but I'm not getting in, I'm not earning that much money, but I'm working all hours of the day and night. So part of it is pricing. Right? How do you actually price effectively so you can sustain something? And this is whether you want to build something on the side or whether you want to grow this into a full-time business, both very, very important. So what I'm going to dive into is the art of client pricing. And I'm going to be taking you through five core concepts um, that I teach a lot and really diving into them as well. Now, at the end of the session, at the end of the workshop, we will have some time for questions um, that you've got. So if you've got some questions, we've had a few people have sent some questions in as well. Um, and we'll, we'll try and answer at least some of them as well at the end. They could be related to pricing. They could be related to other things around um, art and business um, that we might be able to help you with as well. All right, so I'm going to dive in. So the first thing I'm going to really talk about is around what we call value-based pricing. Okay, and when I first heard about this concept, it totally blew my mind. 
because it is something that's quite interesting because it's something that most people overlook when they think about their creative skills and abilities. So the idea here is that we should price our work based on value first. Okay, that's how we figure out pricing first. Now, what happens is a lot of people go, oh, okay, how much time did I spend on this thing? What is my hourly rate? What am I worth? Right now, I'm going to talk about that next because that is like, you totally need to take that into account, but it's not where you start. Where you start is what are people willing to pay for this thing? Right now, I'm going to give you a really fun example of when I was in uh, Copenhagen Airport a number of years ago. Um, I travel a lot. I didn't actually mention where I am right now. I'm actually in Nicaragua. So I do run my business fully remotely. I spend a lot of time in the States, um, in Europe, and occasionally in New Zealand, and then sometimes Central and South America. So I happen to be in Nicaragua, Nicaragua um, San Juan del Sur at the moment. But I was in uh, Copenhagen Airport a couple of years ago. And I was jet lagged because I'd flown from New Zealand, like New Zealand is on the opposite side of the world from Europe. So the sun is rising when the sun's setting in the other place, very confusing, 12 hours apart. So I had, I was very jet lagged. I'd flown to Copenhagen airport and I was on a transit. I was stuck there for 10 hours, Ugh, 10 hours in the airport. We all know what that's like. And I wanted a coffee, right? I was dying for a soy mocha, like, oh. You know, I've been drinking airplane coffee for, for the last two days. And those of you that don't know, it actually takes you 30 hours to get from New Zealand to Europe. It's crazy. You've got to do like two 15-hour flights. It's a whole thing. Anyway, I won't go on about that. But hey, I was jet lagged. I think you've all got that message. I wanted a coffee. So I went to the cafe queue and I thought, I wonder what the conversion rate is here, right, for a coffee. So I went to, I went to check on my phone. What's the conversion rate? And I checked and it was actually going to be about 15 US dollars for a cup of coffee in Copenhagen airport. 15 US dollars, right? And I was jet lagged. I needed to get some work done. I felt a broggy. I was going to be there for 10 hours. Now, raise your hand if you think that I paid for that coffee. Raise your hand if you think I, I was the sucker that paid for the coffee, right? I think everyone's got it, right? I paid for that coffee. Right, because to me, even though I grumble about it and now I tell stories about it, I really give my value out of that coffee, I'll tell you that. But to me, at that moment, I was willing to pay that. It was worth $15 because I paid for it. Okay, so actually they're just charging based on what people are willing to pay. Now we're not talking about medical care. I'll have a, there's a whole conversation around how that shouldn't be overpriced and how some things yeah, people are being taken advantage of. But when it comes to coffee, like I know we all love coffee, but in the end they can charge what they want at Copenhagen Airport and I can decide whether I buy it or not. Okay, and I had a great time in Copenhagen Airport. I had my coffee boost, I was awake, I got lots of work done. It was totally worth that. Now, yes, I might grumble about it, but I still spent the money. Okay, so my point there is it's not about um, it wasn't about how much that coffee cost them to make because a cup of coffee costs like 50 cents to make. Sure, they've got to pay their wages of their staff and probably in the airport, they have to pay more for rent for the airport. But actually, they know that people are stuck at the airport, they're bored and they're willing to pay for that coffee. Okay, so the key point here is that you should actually pay what people are willing to pay. Okay, if someone is willing to pay you $1,000 for something that took you one hour of your time, Good on you. Good on you for finding a way to create value in a very easy way. Now, maybe it's because you are amazing at what you do. You have, you're, you're really talented. You've, maybe you've studied for, for a time. Maybe you've, you've got these expertise, these experiences from your life that you can create that value. But if people are willing to pay, then you should be charging it. Okay, so that's the first piece. And I know it's more complex than that, but that's the first thing that most people overlook. And you actually want to charge the maximum that people are willing to pay for what you do, okay? So yes, it's important to the other things that I'm gonna go over with, but this is what we start with. And to be honest, I could just finish there the whole webinar and say, just remember that because that is the important thing. And it's something that a, a, actually a mentor said to me about 10 years ago. They said, Logan, price based on what the market can withstand. And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't really get it. Price based on what people will pay. Price based on the highest point that people are willing to spend their money for. This is really interesting. And tell you what, it's a lesson that keeps coming back to me as well. We're going to go on to number two. Um, but before we do that, did you have anything you wanted to sort of add to that um, as well, Raphael? Um, just, just around that value-based pricing and how people value um, their, their, their work. Love it. Totally makes sense. Can feel unintuitive for many people. And what I've seen is that 
some people like to ramp up towards that until they find what the market can withstand till they hit a ceiling where people are whoa saying whoa oh that's a bit high whoa but uh it can take some raising of your prices to, to find that point so you don't know what the market can withstand until you ask the market really amazing a hundred percent agree and i think yeah you're right it's, it's sometimes about just getting out there and going for it putting i sometimes say putting a stick in the ground i'm going to price it this but then raising it as Raphael said right raising it over time as well um to to see right and and, and something i will share towards the end I'll, I'll sort of reiterate it now is that you should have some people saying no right you should have some people saying no you're too expensive how do you pay that how do you charge that if you're not if, if everyone's saying yeah 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 that's good yep yep have to buy your thing right then actually you're not pricing it high enough okay so it's something very much to be aware of when it comes to pricing you want to price based on what the market can withstand all right number two i'm going to talk you through number two because number two is very interesting in that yes we've got it based on what the market can withstand uh, once we've done that we've then still got to do the numbers right we've still got to calculate the costs and our time involved okay so i'm not saying disregard that completely i'm just saying it's not where you start so I'm not saying you start with, okay, how many hours did this thing take me or this thing to deliver? What are the costs involved? And then you price it. No, no, I'm, I'm saying you do that second. Value-based pricing first. How much can I charge? What's the maximum? And then I've got to do the numbers to make sure this works for me. All right, and this is something that I do with many of, many of my clients. I say, great, you're doing this thing here. You're a designer, you're an artist, you're, you're a painter, whatever it is. How long did it take you to create this thing? Now, obviously, as creative, sometimes we want to get into that creative flow and not think about the time. So sometimes it's just an estimate, and that's actually okay. As you get more into it, you might have different ways where you can start to, you know, roughly know the timing involved and to create something. Because you kind of want to know whatever you're selling it for, like, what does that mean your time is worth? Right? And I've seen people, I've done this equation where people are saying, oh, I'm charging $200 for this thing. And I'm like, cool, okay, how long does it take you? And they're like, oh, I don't know, it's not that long. I'm getting paid $200, it's great. And I go, cool, like how, how many hours? And they're like, I don't know, like probably only like 15, 20 hours, right? And I'm like, so you're getting paid like 10 or $15 per hour for your time. Are you okay with that? And maybe they're okay. They might be like, yep, that, that's fine. Or maybe they might be like, I didn't realize that knowledge is power when it comes to this stuff. And we want you to at least know these numbers. Now, yes, you might be going, okay, well, ooh, I'm only getting this rate and I want to get more. First piece is making sure you're aware of what those numbers look like. And yes, it might be a rough calculation because you're not really sure exactly what it is. Um, if you're selling prints of what you do for those people that do the print thing, yes, you can replicate that into many, many items and then think about those bigger, longer term sales. It's more scalable. But particularly if it's a one-off thing, you need to be aware of these numbers. And then you can start to think about what is your time worth? What do you want to get paid? If you're like, you know what? My time is worth $50 or $100 an hour. Well, that means that if you're selling something for $200, you need to create it in two hours. Is that possible? Right? And you might say, no, that's impossible. Okay, what could you create in two hours that you could sell for $200? Right, it doesn't actually matter the, the values, the amounts I'm talking here, you know, wherever, whatever product you have. It's really about making sure you do the numbers. The other side of the time element is actually the cost element as well, right? What are the material costs involved, right? Is there any shipping costs you need to think about if it's a physical product? Even if you are offering a service and you're like, cool, I'm offering a service in person, right? I'm, I'm running an, an art course and I'm driving somewhere. Did you think about petrol involved? Right, the petrol, the, the, the gas to get there. Right, so so these are the sorts of things you need to think about. Maybe materials. You, if those of you that that paint here, you might be like, "Cool, ah, oh, it's not that much on paint, but we all know paint can get expensive. It can really add up, and you might be surprised." So once again, how do you measure this? Sometimes it's a bit of guesswork, and that's okay. But we want you to be thinking about what are the costs involved, what is the time involved, and then doing those equations. I call them um, back of the back of the envelope equations that you can do. Right, so the idea is that it's a pretty simple equation. You go, cool. How many hours? What am I selling for? Divide these things. Maybe take out the the costs of materials as well, just to work out the numbers. Right, these are the sorts of numbers that we need to know. And we sometimes think, as artists, as creatives, well, the math stuff. No, like that's not what we want to do. And I'm like, no, no, we need to do that if we want to be successful professional creatives with a business. 
Now, if this is a hobby, you don't need to do these things and there's nothing wrong with that. But these are important numbers to do um, if you want to grow this, which is really, really important. Fantastic. I'm going to keep moving through um, the, these different things. I know some questions um, are popping up in the chat, but I will I'll try and address them. Some of them as we go, but some of them I'll do at the end as well. So the next the next piece here is number number three I'm going to talk about is target market. But before I jump into that, did you have anything you wanted to add around the costs or the numbers um, or really thinking about material costs, Raphael, um, sort of on that side? I think you covered it. It's just something that some of us don't want to take a look at. We sort of neglect it or ignore it until someone else asks the hard questions. <laughs> someone like you who gives the accountability and makes us take out the envelope and, and pencil it out. So it's good to have that conversation and just have a ballpark idea. So we're not, um, we're not kidding ourselves. We, we know that our, we spent a hundred dollars of paint on that painting. So we're going to add that, that cost of materials in for sure. I love it. And you know, it, it's kind of, a, it's about doing the work and the numbers behind this, right? It doesn't need to be too complex and we don't need to get like to the decimal points. Often with my clients, I'm like, we don't, let's take out the decimal points and the decimal points are not going to make a difference, right? It's really about going, okay, well, I think it was about this price here, right? We're starting to look at the averages and, and the rough number back of the envelope calculations as we said. Okay, cool. What we're going to look at next um, and number three is really around understanding who your audience is, understanding who your client is, your customer. You might use the word target market. You could use the word, yeah, a person you, you want to work with or a person you're selling to, right? So this is really important to understand who it is that is your client, your customer, because that will affect what they're willing to pay, right? What they're willing to actually spend with you. Okay, and some people they find, oh, you know, Logan, I don't know, everyone just keeps saying to me, I'm too expensive. And I'm like, cool, who, who is everyone? Who, who is your, your people that you're working with? And they say, oh, they're, they're people that are doing this. And maybe they're people that don't actually have access to the funds to pay for this sort of thing. I remember when I was a student, when I was at university, right? I was, I was living off a very small amount of money. I couldn't afford to spend money on many things. Somehow we did manage to, to spend money to go to the pub. But apart from that, like, it was really like, it's, we didn't have a lot of spare money. So we would have been a terrible market, a terrible audience to market anything towards. Right? I think the thing that we did get marketed towards us was like, uh, you know, ramen and two minute noodles right? Because I guess they're cheap and it's what students live off in New Zealand, right? But the key there is understanding your audience and understanding who is willing and able to pay. Now you might say, but I love selling to students or I love selling to these, these sorts of people. I love delivering my art to them. And, and I get that. But I also say, are you a charity? Right? So I know this is hard things to hear sometimes, but I say, are, are you a charity? You know, well, no. And like, do you want to do you want to be able to spread your art out there, your creativity out there? Do you want to be able to work with people long term? Do you want to have a sustainable business doing this? Now, I'm not saying sell your soul, right? It's not about that. It's about getting sometimes doing some of the work around who could your audience be? Who is willing to pay for this sort of work? The, the other piece of this is sometimes you might have different audiences, different types of customers that you sell to. And I'll, I'll give a really specific example here with my previous um, entertainment company. Now, we were doing a lot of uh, student events. We were doing a lot of uh, community events. We were doing some private events. So this is providing cool entertainment, stilts walkers, fire dancers, jugglers on venue entrance. Um, for that and tell you what in those early years we were struggling we were struggling to make it work and you know their budgets were tight money was they were always like trying to negotiate they didn't have a lot of big budgets so actually what we decided was we were going to start working with some corporates as well right some corporate companies so it wasn't all of our work was going to corporates we actually preferred to provide entertainment for the other the student events the community events the private events we, we found that a lot more fun but actually about a third of the events we did were the corporate events, okay? Because that's what helped pay the bills. It's also, they were willing to pay a lot more. They had bigger budgets. And that actually allowed us to grow our business to be bigger, it allowed us to access more people. And over time, it meant we could actually do a lot more with the community events, right? Because we've grown the business, we've grown our awareness, we've done more marketing. But for quite a while, we went to a lot of corporate events. Now, once again, I'm not saying just, do corporate stuff and whatever that is for you. You, you. you may not want to do that, but you could consider 
having a target market that really helps to balance the other target markets. So if you're really passionate about helping people or providing your, your product, your services to people who have lower incomes, like that's totally fine, but you need to balance that out with people who have those high incomes, okay? But even then I still say, are you a charity? Right, something we need to be very aware of as well. So, you know, I, I talk a lot about the stuff around, you know, this idea of target markets, this idea of who your customer is and getting, getting really clear on that. Now, something that many people say is, uh, when I say, who, who's your audience? Who's your target market? They go, well, anyone, anyone, you know, anyone that likes my work, my designs, my creativity, my photography, my, my images, whatever it is that you do, anyone, right? Anyone that loves it, I'm happy to sell to them. Now, the problem is there's a saying, which is that if you try and promote and market to everyone, then you're not going to promote and market to anyone, right? an individual, because everyone feels like you're not speaking to them as an individual. Right? If you say, hey, everyone, this is what I do. Well, no one's going to feel like you're talking to them. They're just going to feel like you're talking to everyone. Whereas if you say, if you say hey, corporates, look at these things that we do. Well, the corporates are like, oh, this is designed for us. Or hey, community events, or whatever it was that we were doing, I was giving the example of my company, then actually they'll feel like this message is for them. They'll feel like the products that you have are for them. All right, so this is where I talk about, I work with the visual creatives. They're the core area of what I work with, the people I work with, I work with visual creatives. Now, could I help and work with other types of creatives? Musicians, dancers, actors, people in theater? Yes, absolutely, I could. I've got the experience, I've got the skills. Our program would actually probably also, our coaching program would probably be able to help those people. But it's not the area that I've decided to, to target. If I said I can help all creatives, then actually probably no one's going to feel like my program and my work is designed for them. Instead, we say, hey, I, I work with visual creatives. And people love that. They go, awesome, this is a, a business coach who works with visual creatives. There's not that many people like, like me out there that do that. Right, so you can see that targeting, getting really specific about who your audience is, is super, super important. Um, any any extra extra thoughts around that idea there, Raphael, around you know, targeting audience and thinking about the customer? My only thought there is that sometimes we don't realize the bubble that we're in. We just know these people and that's the world that we live in. And it, it can take a little effort to find another bubble. Some people think that's like leveling up to higher value people or something. They're just different people, different bubbles. And, and there's an art to overlapping them and going into a new market, if you like, which is connecting with different people. And I'd just say, usually it takes one person, one acquaintance, friend, connection you have to, who could open that world for you. So uh, perhaps you could just think about who you know and if we're talking about um, potentially higher income collectors, something like this, then just think, who would that be? And would it just be a question? Like perhaps they could introduce me or my work to, to their, their circle. So in a way, they're a gatekeeper, but it, this only works in a, in a friendly way if they want to endorse you and your work wholeheartedly. So just to summarize that we don't sometimes realize the bubble we're in the sphere of people that we know so think about perhaps what other bubbles you could overlap with if you want to if you want to change your target market or your potential collectors and buyers i love it so so powerful and you know you're right we all we all live in our own bubbles Right, wherever we are in the world, we live in our bubbles of who we know, what our friends and family do, what we are willing to spend money on, what our friends spend money on, right? And we might be like, well, I would never spend money on the sorts of things that I, that I sell. My, none of my friends would, none of my family would spend hundreds of dollars on this thing. It's like, well, yes, but there's plenty of people in the world that will. And there's plenty of people that will value what you do a huge amount. You just got to find them. So sometimes, as, as Raphael said, it's getting out of the bubble as well. I, I really love that. Cool. Next one we're going to talk about, number four here, is basically around this idea of, of pricing around um, how many opportunities you have. And I'm going to kind of expand on this because it's a little bit confusing. Basically, the idea is that if you had more opportunities, you would be able to charge more. Now, let's all imagine for all of you right now, 
you you get off this this call, this webinar with Rick Owen and I, and you go check your emails, and there is 30 emails in there with people that are interested in spending money with you. They're like, hey, I've heard about you. I, I got referred to you. Someone mentioned you. Uh, I would I, I have money. I would love to spend it with you, with what you offer, your products, your services. Send me the link. Send me a quote. Send me your proposals. Right? Send me these things. Now, if you had lots of those opportunities, you wouldn't have the time to deliver them all. Right? You're, you're busy. And you're like, well, okay, I've got a lot of these opportunities now. This is, this is a problem I haven't had before. What you can actually do is you can raise your prices. You can charge more because there will be people within that that are willing to pay. And you've got more people that may say no. Now, if you have one person in your inbox, it's kind of scary because you're like, if I get this wrong and I charge too much, they might say no. And then I've got nothing. Okay, but if you've got lots of opportunities, then actually you can charge more because there's less risk. It's less likely that you're going to have 20 no's if you've got 20 opportunities in your, in your inbox. Okay, so this really comes down to marketing. Okay, and I'll be honest, a big part of what I do in my program and coaching is help people get the marketing stuff right. And I know it's a huge part of what Rafael does with his, his awesome um, Instagram work as well. It's like, how do we grow our audience? How do we connect with more people? How do we share more of what we do? And I think one of the biggest problems for most creative people is that not enough people know that you exist, right? It's not about the level of your creativity. For most people I speak to, their level, their, their, the quality of what they do is really, the bar is really high. Yep, there's always, there's always room to improve. We've always got, we've always all got room to improve at our craft, get better, keep learning. For those of you that are, try different mediums, for sure. But the level that you're at at the moment is probably a level that you can be working with a lot more clients and earning a lot more money than you perhaps are right now. But it's going to come down to more people knowing that you exist, right? And that is actually, that's marketing. So this is one of the things. If you want to increase your pricing, you need to let more people know that you exist. Now, I think we, in, in the creative realm, uh, artistic realm, we, have, we kind of think marketing sometimes a bit of a dirty word. And I kind of, I get that. And I think, let's just re, let's rebrand it. Right, let's, let's rebrand it as it's just sharing because that's all it literally is. Like we overthink this stuff, but it's just sharing who we are and what we do. Right, that, that's literally what marketing is. I think we overcomplicate this stuff. It's just effectively saying, hey, here's me. I'm a creative business coach and I work with these amazing people. And these, this is my story. But I need more people to know that. And you all need more people to know what you do. But we're all pretty scared sometimes of sharing that message. But that's, that's what marketing is. It's just sharing who you are, what you do, how you can help other people. What is the value that you can offer in the world? What is the thing that you can create? How can you help someone? How can you deliver value? How can you deliver a product, a service? Right, that's what it really is. So, so you know, just going back to my, my point there is saying, hey, if you're in high demand, you can charge more. You can also say no. This is really interesting because you can actually say no to, you might be like, oh, you know, those, those corporates, I don't want to work with them anymore, right? Well, you can say no. If you've got, if you've got 100 community events or 100 people that want to work with you, well, you don't need to say yes to the people you don't want to work with. Right, so you suddenly get more power in your creativity. And this is what it's about as well. Many clients I work with, it's not just about the money. Hey, who doesn't want to earn $10,000 per month and get a sustainable business? For sure. But also what a lot of people also want to do is they want their freedom. They want their flexibility. They want to spend more time with family. Maybe they don't want to work every day of the, of the week. They want to take Fridays off. They want to be able to go on vacation. But also they want to do more creative work. They want to be able to express themselves more often creatively. Right, this stuff, this stuff is so important because this is our lives. We want to use these creative abilities and skills that we have. Now, if we are always working on projects that we don't enjoy, we're not expressing much of that creativity. But if we are doing some marketing as well and getting our message out there, it means we can start to pick and choose. Oh, actually, I'm going to do the more fun, the more creative projects. So it's something that you can do, particularly as you grow your business. It takes time. It's not all like, great, great, we're, we're done. It's like, no, like I've got a client right now who I've been working with for two years. Right? The first six months, she left her day job. She built her business up, got to a few thousand dollars, left her day job, and then we built it up. Right, And now she's starting to shift into more creative work. She was doing a lot of graphic design before, and now 
It's a, it, when we started, it was like 100% graphic design freelance to get her out of that, that day job, that toxic day job that she had. I said she did that first. Once we got her out, increased the revenue, and then it was like 20% illustration work, 80% graphic design. And then we slowly moved it. And at the moment, it's about 50-50, right? So for her, the illustration work, she finds it's more creative, um, more fulfilling as well, but she's still got the kind of the graphic design stuff to pay the bills. And some people love the graphic design stuff. Everyone's different as well. So um, you have any, any extra things around that marketing stuff there, Rico, you wanted to mention um, around that and, and the sharing idea too? Nothing to add. I love it. Amen. Marketing is the same as sharing. Let's rebrand it. I love it. I well, think it's official, everyone. We, I think we've done it. We've rebranded it. Let's, let's make it official. So everyone spread the word. Everyone spread the word. Hey, I will jump into the chat because I know there's been a couple of good things here from um, so Susan. Uh, so I know your first one there. How do you find that point? If you want to just reiterate what you meant by that one, because I have lost you on that one there. Um, but you've got the second question there. What happens if you have many different target markets? It's a very, very good point. So my recommendation is generally to try and focus on three. Right now, it depends how you define the target markets. Um, right, you could say, well, students could be one target market, or you could go deeper into that and say, well, you've got uh, different types of students, like secondary school students, primary school, you've got university, you've got polytechnic. Right, there's lots of different types. It's kind of up to you to, to define that. There's a lot of there's a lot of sort of fiddling around with these things, but think. Often, what I see is that people have too many different target markets, and they're all very different. And what happens is you're trying to market over here, and you're trying to market over here, and you're trying to market over here. Okay, so just be aware, you know, three target markets is a good rule of thumb and you kind of don't want them to be too different. Now, sometimes they might be, right? So for example, I have clients that I'm working with right now who have two target markets. They have a target market with clients who have small businesses that they would want to work with, right? They, they, they do their graphic design work, logo, branding design, but then they also like to have a market where they help other designers, Right, target market where they're helping other designers. They have maybe something on Skillshare, maybe they have some courses as well. So they've kind of got these two different target markets, but you just want to avoid having a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. Now, as you grow your business, you can often open up your target markets to have more, but particularly early on, one is good, two is okay, three is fine. Beyond that, you're getting things getting very, very confusing around it. So first question was on how to find the right price point. Oh, that I mean, big question there and, and very challenging um, one to answer in some ways. I, I'm going to actually jump into the next point because we're going to talk about that a little bit more and give some extra pricing hacks around these things because you're right. It's like, great, how do we find that price? I'm going to give some extra hacks um, and we're going to dive into that. That will hopefully help answer that question. So how do we find the price? One thing that we can do is we can ask for their budget. Now, I'll be honest, it doesn't always work, but you can always ask people, well, how much were you thinking to spend? What is your budget on this? What are you willing to pay? Now, keeping in mind, whatever their answer is, if they do answer you, doesn't mean that they won't spend more. Right? Hey, we've got a $200 budget. Okay, well, you could send a pitch to them saying, here's what we're going to do for 200 here's what we can do for 400 here's what we can do for 600 and I've seen people again and again spend $600, $400, the $200, or they say no, even though they said they had money in the first place. These things can all happen. And this is something, a mistake I see a lot of people making. If they've asked for the budget, they then just pitch to their budget. They don't say, hey, here's some other things I could also offer beyond your budget. I know you've said your budget's that, but keep in mind, I've got some other things I could do as well. Because if people see the value, they might be willing to spend the money. And it's amazing how many times people say, oh, I've just managed to find some more money. I managed to open up my budget. Oh, you know, actually, I'm willing to spend more because there's this great thing that I really want. And I, I often say when people really, really want something, they, they, they'll figure it out. Right? We see that again and again. So, you know, I think it's a really powerful thing to think about. Now, I'll be honest, a lot of people won't tell you the answer, right? So once again, if I think about my graphic design and illustration clients, you know, I often encourage them to say, hey, what's your budget? Um, probably about 20% of them actually get an answer saying, well, a lot of people say, oh, um, I would just love to hear your prices. So it doesn't always work, but it is a good tip to sometimes try where you can. Next thing I'll talk about um, is basically understand what others around you are charging. Now I say this one very, very carefully because sometimes what happens is people go and check out what other people are charging in this space and they freak out. They're like, wow, everyone's charging way more or way less than I am. 
Okay, and they're like, okay, so I need to raise my price. I need to lower my price and whatever that is. Keep in mind, there's always going to be people charging more and there's always going to be people charging less for pretty much anything any of us here in this, in this entire room do. Okay, there's always going to be, there's literally, no matter what your price is, there's going to be someone else who's charging half what you do, half what you charge. There's going to be someone else charging double. Okay, but it gives you a good idea of where the positioning is in the market. Right. And I actually found it very, very empowering at one point, you know, my coaching career, when I found out what some other coaches were charging, I was like, wow, I didn't know that was, actually, that was even possible. So it helped me understand the possibility. But also I've seen, oh, wow, that, that what some people charge, that isn't much. Right. So it's good to get a range, but just be aware your mind will go into free cash. It doesn't mean you have to just go to the, the rates that other people are charging. It just helps give you an overview, an idea. And some things people you don't know, you don't know because people often don't list pricing on their websites for some things, right? Now, if you have friends, this is why it's great to have creative friends. That's why it's great to build a community because I think we can have these more open conversations with these connections with friends, right? And actually talk to each other. Hey, like, do you mind sharing? I'd love to know, like, what are the sort of rates that you charge? Right? We should be helping each other out with this stuff. It's not about competition, it's about collaboration. Right, so really, really, really important point there. Um, another one is look at what you've charged in the past. And this is kind of what um, Rafael was talking about before. Like once you've charged something, you now know that you can charge at least that to at least some per one person. So it means that you might be able to charge a bit more and maybe you can charge a bit more. So one of the things I see is people often increase their pricing based on when they're really busy and they don't have a lot of time available. And someone says, are you available? And they go, oh, yes, but I have a last minute fee, an extra fee, or like I'm pricing it like I don't want to do it. That's another, another good tip, price it like you don't want to do it. And they say, oh, well, you know, I normally, they're thinking to themselves, I normally charge, you know, $200, but I'm so busy right now. If it was $300, I'd do it, but they're never going to pay that. And then this person goes, yeah, that's great. I'll pay $300. Okay, my new price is now $300. Right, you've now, now proven that. So often just think about the reference points of what you've charged in the past. Now, I know if you haven't sold much in the past, you don't always have that as a reference point. This is just one of the things that you could use. I will share just um, a couple more tips and then we're going to head pretty soon into Q&A because I really want to dive into some of the things that are popping up. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I said before that uh, sort of near the start, 20% of people should say no. Right, 20, this is another rule of thumb. If, if you're selling something, product or service, whatever it is, and everyone, everyone says yes, right? So these are interested people come to you, they're interested in buying your product, and then you say it's this amount, and they go, great, I'll buy it. But yeah, everyone's really happy, everyone says yes all the time. That means that you could probably ch be charging more. There needs to be some, we call it friction in the marketplace. There needs to be some friction out there, which some people should say no. Now, it's a rule of thumb. Keep in mind, for some people, it could be 50% of people say no. Okay, and that, that might be okay as well. But again, I see people uh, not realizing that actually some people need to say no. And those people that say no, those 20%, they might be annoyed. They might be angry. They might be saying, how dare you charge that? Who do you think you are? Right? They have a flaming stick and, and then they'll be like, who, who do you think you are? You're crazy. You can't, you can't charge it. And it'll really, it'll affect us. It'll, it'll really touch our heart because we're like, maybe I'm not worth it. Even though you've got 80% of people saying yes, those people that are, that are saying no, they'll, they'll be annoyed about it because they maybe want the thing that you have, right? So people saying no is okay. Now, the thing I will say is that just because people say no to buying a thing, it's not just because of price. This is the thing that comes up in pretty much everyone's mind. As soon as someone says no, you go, oh, it's because of the price. It's because I priced it wrong. There are so many reasons that people will say no to working with you or buying your product or your service beyond price. Price could be one of them, but there's like nine other things, right? So for example, maybe it's just not the style they're looking for. Maybe they don't have the time. Maybe they haven't, they don't trust you. Right? Is this person just going to run off with my money, run off around the corner, I'll never see them again? Right? So maybe there's not enough trust. Maybe you don't have any referrals or recommendations. I right? said so there's lots of different reasons why people won't pay for something. It's not just because of the price tag. And sometimes, I'm going to, I'm going to end on this one here because this is really incredible. Sometimes it's because your pricing is too low. Right? Your pricing is too cheap, so they value this thing as being cheap. And they, some people don't want to just buy the cheapest thing. They want to get the good thing, the premium thing. All right, really, really powerful point there is that sometimes what you need to do is to increase your prices, 
to hit a more premium market. And that is the best place to operate for any business is not at the cheaper end. I never want to be known as the cheapest coach in town. Right? That's my absolute nightmare. We were never the cheapest entertainment in town either when we were providing entertainment. We were like, we had people saying, oh, you're quite expensive, but we would love to work with you because we know it's worth it. Right? And I remember in an entertainment company, when people said that, we were like, we're on to it. We were getting our pricing right. Did you have anything to add on that, um, Raphael, before we jump into the questions? You got it. Nothing to add. It's awesome. Good to see some questions rolling in. If you have questions, please jump in the chat now. Cool. Awesome. Fantastic. So I'm going to start working through this. And what I will also do now, um, I'm going to fire in that survey again. So just another mention is what we will be doing is we'll be giving away um, three, are we giving away three freebie 30 minute coaching calls? So you're just going to enter the survey. And this is for people that are watching the recording. We're going to send the, the link through afterwards as well. But if you're here right now, you can even just pop this link open. Cool. I'll just fire it in there. And then we're going to jump into Q&A. So feel free to pop that open so you've got it there. If, if you're interested in getting on a call, I'd love to connect with some of you. Cool. Like right. there. Yeah, How I first met Logan was a, a freebie coaching call with Logan. I was, I managed to connect with him and that was our first connection. And it must be 18 months ago. And we got, this guy's cool. He knows his stuff. Awesome. So I, I would personally highly recommend this. He'd be, be fortunate to get 30 minutes of his time. Amazing. I, I actually forgot about that. That's amazing. That's so good. That's how we first connected. I love it. And so, you know, like this is what we're talking about around the bubble thing as well. Like both Raphael and I got out of our own bubbles and connected to someone else that we can now collaborate with. Right. So, so powerful. I love that. Really, really cool. All right. So um, question we're going to jump into here, um, Karen. So how would you actually go about targeting a certain, certain market, i.e. professional corporate to share your artwork and creativity? All right, so that's a very good question. So often, whatever the target market is that you're wanting to work with, like the question to ask, it's kind of obvious, but it's where do they hang out? Where do they spend their time? Where do they spend their energy? Okay, and then when I say hang out, I'm talking about all areas. Where do they physically hang out? Right? Do they go to like physical networking events? Do they go to the gym? Right? Do they go to which type of supermarket would they go to? Right? Would they uh, like how how do they spend their their time on weekends? Are they going to parks? Like like physically, where are they hanging out? Do they spend most of their time at home? They never really go out. Right? Then obviously, where do they spend their time online? It's another big part of that. Right? So if you're like cool, like I'm currently marketing on Instagram. Or is the people that you want to target, are they hanging out on Instagram? Are corporate people hanging out on Instagram? And in some markets, they are. But if we're talking about corporates, you might be thinking, hmm, okay, we might start thinking about things like LinkedIn as a social, social platform. Right? That's a place where a lot more people who are corporates, professionals might hang out. Okay, so we, we really start to dig into this. And we can, we can even just do some brainstorming. Right, because the answers aren't always clear. We've got to do that brainstorm and go, hmm, okay, these types of corporate professionals, where do they spend their time and energy? And then how, obviously, the next part of that is great. They hang out on LinkedIn or they hang out in parks, they hang out in supermarkets, whatever it is. How do we connect with them? How do we meet with them? Is it that we need to go to some sort of networking event or a social event? Is it that we need to go to some Friday drinks to connect with people? Is it that we need to go to golf? I don't know, whatever it is. Is it that we need to hang out on LinkedIn? Is it we need to build a profile there and be actively posting and connecting with people on LinkedIn? I don't know how to use LinkedIn, Logan. Great, learn, right? You figure out the basics. You don't need to be an expert on any of these things, but it could be a really good way to connect with those people. Now, the thing I do say is we can end up having 15 different marketing strategies. I'm a big believer on focus in this stuff right? Being in one or two social media platforms, right? Not trying to be on 15 different social media platforms, right? So something that's something really, particularly when you're early stage, right? As you grow your business, you can expand out. Maybe you can build a team. You can get them on, on you know, helping you as well. Cool. And just, just jump in if you want to add anything to these ones, Raphael. Otherwise, I'll keep working through these, these next questions. Cool. So Sharon, I market, I invest in magazine ads. I've got work in galleries and outgoing and tell the stories behind the work. Rich people like emotional based purchases. That's, that's a really, that's a really important point there. Is I mean, rich people, I say all, all, you know, all people as well love, you know, the emotion behind it, the story behind it. I love that. I study my um, demographic data, I charge these rates. Cool. I've got good reviews. I still can't sell more than two paintings each season. I'm networking well. Maybe I need to be more patient. I totally hear you. And I think, 
it's so frustrating, Sharon, when you feel like you're doing all of the things and things aren't working. Like I totally hear you within this. And one and once again, I don't know your individual situation, but it may go back to what I was talking about before, which is sometimes what happens is we're spreading ourselves too thin across too many different mediums. Now, maybe it's not what you're doing, but sometimes people are not going deep enough into one. Right. So I talked to a lot of clients who are like, oh, you know, like I'm on Instagram, I'm, I'm promoting myself on there. Um, and you know, I'm doing lots and it does not work. And I'm like, great, like tell me more. How how much? And you're like, I, I like post every few days. And I'm like, are you doing reels? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, that's what we've got to be doing. As frustrated as we are about the whole thing around needing to do reels, right? We've got it. If we want to be on Instagram and we want to use that as a core marketing strategy, we've got to figure this stuff out. Right? Or we've got to get someone to help us figure it out. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure Raphael probably is, might even have some different advice around that. But, but you know, the, the key here is you've got, you've got to lean into whichever medium it is and go deeper, right? So often a lot of these, whether it's social media platforms or different areas, you've got to be there more, right? So I don't know for you if that looks like maybe being in that magazine more, maybe not because they're really expensive. Um, the next tip I will give um, you around this, Sharon, is look really closely at where people have purchased in the past. Like we have, people have found you in the past, right? If you've been, if you've been selling, you know, you have, you have been selling maybe for a few years by the look of it, like do the numbers go, okay, out of the last 30 things that you've sold, where did those 30 people first find out about you? Because that gives you a huge clue as to where you should lean in and spend more time and energy. In my program, I should get people to, we've got a really cool pie chart where they just like enter in the numbers and it like creates this beautiful, colorful pie chart. Right? And people, every time they do it, they're like, wow, like I didn't think about that. Because like, I, I always say to them, where do you think people are coming from? And they say, oh, well, I think they're coming through Instagram. The data, once we get the data, the numbers doesn't always say that. Now, some people say, but Logan, I don't know. I don't know where people are coming from. Then I say, you need to start finding out. You need to start asking people right, when they purchase from you. Hey, just curious, if you don't mind sharing, how did you, how did you come across my work? How did you find out about me? So that could be some good things for you to think about there as well, Sharon. We're gonna, we're gonna keep working through these questions. So I love these questions, everyone. So many good things popping up. We may not get to them all, but we'll do our very, very best. Fantastic. Do, do you recommend, uh, Tasia? do you recommend listing our prices on Instagram if we just started an Instagram? Hey, Rafael, do you wanna jump into this one? Would, would you be up for that one? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, hi, Tasha. thanks for joining us. Good to see you come over from, from Instagram where we connected. Uh, look, there's different thoughts on this. My feeling is no. My feeling is no. It's, uh, there's something more subtle. You can be much more subtle. So instead of saying available for commissions, paintings for sale, these are the prices, which is so overt, you can be very subtle by putting your work out there. And if it is available, can say available for inquiries or DM for inquiries, this kind of thing. And if it is and sold, it's the other side of that coin, then instead of using the word sold, you can phrase this in a very professional way, such as now in the home of a collector or now in a private collection. Sounds very good. In a private collection in New York State. Uh, however, you phrase this, it's it's a really classy way of saying sold <laughs> and letting people know you've sold so once you have sold that's what i suggest and while you're wanting to like put yourself out there that your paintings are available just say dm for inquiries dm for commissions but i wouldn't put prices you may have them on your website if, if that would make sense but not on instagram so much instagram it's it's very subtle selling it's mostly sharing and if they're selling, it's happening through the DMs or people converting to somewhere else like your website. That's my suggestion there. Oh, and your second part was discounts to friends and family. I'll put in my two cents here. <laughs> my two cents is yes. <laughs> my two cents is yes, because they can really support you and rave about you. They can be your warm fans. But if I were you, I would decide on a value for that. Say, oh, it's 20% from my friends and discount from my friends and family. And that's what I do for all of them. I would decide in that a professional way. There can be exceptions, sure. But that way you both feel good. You're giving them a good deal. They feel you're giving them a good deal while, while offering a professional service. 
and you're not being distant about it like no i only charge this high rate my feeling is yes but um you can decide a professional level for it which is across the board very personal choice that's my two cents i wonder if logan has thoughts on this as well I, I love it. I'm totally with you with you on both of these things, um, you know, in terms of whether you list your pricing or not. Um, and one of the things I will say, like, to everything here that Rafael and I have shared, there is exceptions, right? There is exceptions to every single rule. There'll be times where you should not offer discounts. There's times where you should maybe put your pricing online, right? There's going to be exceptions to everything. Right, so always keep that in mind, and that this is where sometimes the intricacies of even the work that we do is, is important because we're going deeper into it and going, okay, well, let's look at this a bit more closely. Right, but I totally agree with um, Rafael there around, you know, this, this pricing friends and family. That can be a great way to start building your audience, and I, I love that. Set a set a fixed amount, and also just make sure that you're still making something from it. You're not just once again you're in our charity for your friends and family. Also, there's going to be a point where you might not be able to do the things for your friends and family or they're going to be at the bottom of the list. So you can say to them, hey, yeah, absolutely. I've got a discount. But keep in mind my timeline, you're at the bottom of the list because you're paying the least. If you're happy to wait, that's totally okay. All right, so, so that's another way to work it as well um, around that too. But, you know, lots of different views. And there's certainly people out there that say pretty solidly like, no, never do that. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's good in some circumstances, once again, dependent on what you are offering, what you are selling as well. Um, you know, and you can certainly sell to friends and family and just charge your normal rates. That's definitely an option as well. So, you know, once again, there's not always a blanket rule around these things here. Cool. So um, Carolina is sharing, what are the best ways to uh, places to ways and places to market your art to start consistently selling prints and portraits online? Um, I mean, I think Instagram, do you want to talk to Instagram briefly around these things, Raphael? Uh, sure. Um, I agree with Logan that there's always exceptions to every role. So this is a general answer. For visual creatives, visual artists, Instagram is the place right now. I would say this keeps evolving. So even within Instagram, it's gone from still images to reels in a big way where you can get 10 times the, the views and things. I would just add to it by saying, I wouldn't, if you're making reels, short form videos, I wouldn't underestimate also putting them on TikTok. We can actually grow a lot faster. They may not be co the collectors you're seeking. They may be teenagers. However, an audience is an audience and it's why not if you're creating that reel. You could even go like YouTube shorts if you want to be up with the trend. You're sharing the same video, short form video, less than 30 seconds on three platforms at once. This could be spreading yourself thin. That's the, the caution on it. But if it's the same video and you just go post, 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 could be doable. Mm, and uh, you're, you're asking what are the best ways and places? Uh, so places is primarily Instagram. Although as Logan said, where are your collectors? Where is your audience? Maybe they are on LinkedIn and maybe they're not online as well. Uh, and the ways when it comes to Instagram is, yeah, reels get you all these views. It's good you can get more followers and things. But if you want a real per person who's gonna buy your creative work or your artwork, they might like your reel. They might wanna see a simple image of your artwork as well. Say on the wall above a mantelpiece looking nice. It may not get all the views and comments and traction, but that's a good to include as well there. There's a place for the virality of a reel and there's a place for a simple image of the artwork so that genuine collectors can see it as it is. So that's that's still an important way. Amazing, I love it. So, so good. So very aware of time now, everyone. So we are gonna to start to wrap up. Now, if you would like, I'd love you to share your Instagram in here. I'm gonna pop it in here as well. Um, if you want to follow each other, follow myself, um, Raphael, try and put it in as a link if you can, rather than just the at tag, because then people will be able to click it. Um, so just go to, you know, put it on a browser, click, grab the URL, pop it in there. 
um, really great way. I'd love to follow some of you as well um, and your awesome Instagrams. So look, I'll, I'll say thank you so much. It's been just an absolute delight, obviously have, running the session with Raphael as well and, and really just sharing and getting you all thinking and thinking about how can you price differently? How can you price um, better as well? So look, you know, there is a lot to it. We totally get it. There's a lot of things to think about here. There might just be one or two things that you take away from today and you take action on. I'm a big one for taking action. Let's not just think about all the ideas. What is one or two things you can do with this information? Okay, so really, you know, those of you that have taken notes, think about what, what is the one thing that I'm going to change in what I'm doing? How am I going to change things around this feedback, these ideas that I've been inspired around as well? So I'll just let everyone, you know, follow other people's Instagrams to so do open them up because once once we wrap up, um, you won't be able to click them. And I'll just say once again, so, so great to be here and just an amazing time to be able to connect with Raphael once again, especially since we're at other ends of the world, world Raphael. You, <laughs> you're literally, I think, on the opposite side of the world right now and it's your your morning right now and it's my evening <laughs> is that right <laughs> i love that amazing fantastic all right well we're going to wrap up everyone thank you so much thanks for joining hope you have a very lovely day thank you so much for um all of your questions as well we really appreciate it we will be sending out this recording too to everyone that signed up to the webinar so keep an eye out for that we'll also put the coaching um form that link again in the in that email as well in case you didn't grab that too awesome thank you everybody take care see us thanks team great to see you all see you on instagram bye <laughs>